Our grand round speaker today is Mitesh Lotia. He is a chief neurology resident, our current, in fact, our current chief resident, um, whom we've known and loved for how many years now? Four? Four years. <laughs> Dr. Lotia, let's see, trained at Turner Medical College in India, uh, did a surgery preliminary residency at Union Hospital, and then internal medicine residency here at UofL, and we've had him ever since. He's done now three years of neurology training. Uh, he's about to graduate and will go on to do a movement disorders fellowship uh, with Dr. Jankovic at Baylor College of Medicine. Um, and we're all very happy about that. Um, Mitesh has been looking for, has been interested in movement disorders for quite some time, although he's quite excellent in everything else too. Um, and he's going to talk with us today, I don't know if Dr. Jankovic inspired him, but he's going to talk with us today about dystonia. Um, and if Baylor beats U of L in the tournament, um, he won't be allowed to graduate. <laughs> but that's that. not likely to happen. So <laughs> I have to pray for that. All right. Thank you, Dr. Evans. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, as Dr. Evans mentioned, my topic for today is uh, dystonia. Uh, these are the objectives. Um, I, I mainly wanted to go through um, the historical aspects of this particular disease um, because we've known about it for quite some time now, but there is a lot of history behind it. And if you want to really enjoy anything, you want to start like how it was uh, observed and how people learned about it. Also, you know, there has been multiple definitions and classifications. So I want to go over all those things together. And then as a neurologist, as a clinician, how would you evaluate such patients in a clinical setting? Uh, and then also that will help us uh, establish some management guidelines. So I want to start with uh, uh, talking about Dr. Uh, Oppenheim, uh, Hermann Oppenheim. He was a very well-known uh, neurologist from uh, Germany, uh, very eminent neurologist of his time. Uh, he has written a textbook uh, of neurology, which by his time already had six editions, and um, he had described a lot of neurological conditions. But his name is very peculiar in terms of dystonia because he actually was the one to coin the term dystonia. Uh, this is the original article that he wrote uh, in 1911. Uh, this was in Germany, um, and um, he described those movements. There is an English translation done, uh, and I have a few uh, excerpts from that, uh, and I'm just going to read through that. So he describes these movements. He said that over the past five years, I have repeatedly observed an affliction whose meaning and classification has caused greater, greater difficulties. When examining the first cases, I was trying to decide between the diagnosis of hysteria and idiopathic bilateral athetosis, but then I soon real realized that uh, neither of these diagnoses were appropriate and that this was a new condition or at least a new type of condition. The disease has something quite unique, namely severe tonic cramps, particularly in neck, head, and the proximal uh, sections of extremities. The unique thought gait is practically pathological. The prognosis is bad. All therapeutic attempts are as of yet unsuccessful. During my efforts to delineate the methodology of the disease through an incisive name, I have selected the titles Dysphagia lordotica and Dystonia muscularum deformans and would prefer the latter. Um, so basically, he was describing these movements which he thought had uh, alternative hypertonia and hypotonia. It was really difficult to put that into perspective. Was it uh, athetosis? Was it a chorea? Um, and he eventually said that, well, we need to do something different about this. It's been written about this uh, qu for quite some time, as I mentioned. Um, the first article, which was probably put in the literature, was back in 1836. Again, a, gen uh, a German neurologist, neurologist uh, Dr. Kopp, uh, he described some features which now are more suggestive of like writer's cramp. Um, so that was the first description we have. There was more of focal dystonia. Um, Gowers described the again something similar to uh, the writer's cramp, but that time they were confusing that with athetosis. Then um, came a Spanish uh, neurologist, Barraquer Riveralta. He actually described a patient who had these uh, contractions and spasms all throughout the body, and um, there was an autopsy done on that patient by uh, William Hammond. Uh, who had some basal ganglia pathology at that time. And then uh, that's how they described that. And that's the uh, William Howman's patient of, uh, th this is what he initially described as athetosis. 
Subsequently, uh, Schwalbe uh, was the one who actually came up with a very good thesis on that back in 1908. He described these patients having more of these issues which were different than uh, the atidosis. And this is one of the patients that Dr. Oppenheim studied uh, who actually had uh, onset on, on the limbs and then basically then generalized, including the uh, truncal uh, dystonias. Uh, after Oppenheim's description of dystonia, uh, everybody had a lot of interest for quite some time, but a lot of people tried to do pathological studies and uh, autopsies, but they could not find really uh, a disease. Uh, maybe a couple of them had some basal ganglia disease, but they really could not come to a conclusion what was actually causing a disease. And um, in 1929, uh, in one of the International uh, uh, Neuro Neurological Congress, uh, the diagnosis itself was refuted. They again said, you know, this is not necessarily organic. This is still most likely psychological. So then, th again, they were going back to the hysteria diagnosis. Um, so most of the neurologists lost interest in, in dystonia for quite some time. Um, and uh, then some, psych but psychiatrists actually still kept the interest going, and they were describing these episodes related to some of the uh, psychological stressors. Um, and uh, one Bocart uh, actually described some of these as more <coughs> pictorial view of what patient he saw. Eventually, uh, it was actually work of Dr. Herz. Uh, he actually uh, took the videos of all these patients, and um, he had several patients in a case series where he again coined the term dystonia, and then over a period of time, he showed them that um, the gait basically had gotten worse, and then there were uh, the inward movements of the uh, uh, limbs. Uh, again, these are clips from that video uh, frames that were used. So we were going from describing pictures, uh, taking pictures, and then video, and now we are all obviously at more of video presentations. So definition. For, for uh, every clinical diagnosis, I think the, there is a huge meaning of uh, definition. Uh, wh why do you want to define something? You want to get actually the best description that you can ever have in a most standardized way. So you can actually have a communication which actually means unique to that particular disease. It always is not that easy, um, especially when you don't know what exactly is going on. So uh, there are a lot of people who try to define these. Um, as I said, starting from uh, Dr. Gower's uh, thought was chorea, and then Schwalbe described as uh, some tics and tonic cramps. Eventually, Oppenheim ended up describing them as dystonias. And then slowly over the period of time, uh, once Dr. Hurst described again more of organic disease, there was more research done. Finally, uh, uh, like uh, a European uh, uh, scientist, Dr. Marston and Dr. Fan, uh, they came up with a definition uh, in 1976, um, and that has also evolved. Uh, the last one, which was used uh, uh, up till now, was this one, uh, and defined as dystonia as a movement disorder characterized by sustained muscle contractions, frequently causing twisting and repetitive movements or abnormal postures. Now, also, this definition has some drawbacks. Um, they are not always sustained. Uh, like, you know, if you take blepharospasms, it's not sustained. It's intermittent. Um, does it always cause twisting? Typically, not necessarily always. Um, take a laryngeal uh, dystonia or dysphonia. There is no twisting, but, you know, there is still abnormal muscle spasm going on. So still, it does not describe everything that you see in dystonia. However, this was the best practical definition we had for a long time. Um, and this is the, finally, there was again a cons consensus meeting uh, in 2013, and they came up with a better definition. Um, so now it is defined as uh, a movement disorder characterized by sustained or intermittent muscle contractions, causing abnormal, often repetitive movements, postures, or both. Dystonic movements are typically patterned, twisting, and maybe tremulous. Um, dystonia is often initiated or worsened by voluntary action and associated with overflow muscle activation. These were cardinal features of dystonia, which were initially missing from the description. Uh, so this helps you overall figure out that, you know, this most likely that you're going towards dystonia. The only uh, movement that you can say that can happen with dystonia is, is some tremors. The rest of the other movements you want to think of something else in terms of diagnosis. All right, so we defined it, but how do we come to a clinical diagnosis of, of dystonia? So say, for example, you are seeing a patient, um, and whenever there is a movement patient, you want to describe those movement characteristics. So uh, first of all, when you describe a characteristic, what is the speed? Um, 
typically myoclonus is just a quick jerk versus um, uh, a tremor can be very slow from Parkinsonism. So is it too slow, is it too fast? Well, for dystonia, it's not too slow, not too flat, fast. <coughs> what is the amplitude? Uh, the, uh, the tremors with the Parkinson's are filled with the very small uh, in amplitude. Bellism can be high amplitude, but this is somewhere in between. And what is the rhythm? Uh, it's not regular as tremor. It's not, uh, it, so it, and it's not irregular as atetosis or chorea. It's somewhere again in between. So it's basically a combination of all three. And if you get answers, sort of yes, uh, if you don't get the answer, then it's, you have to think of something else. But if you get answer as yes, that's maybe pointing towards dystonia. Another characteristic uh, of dystonia is uh, sustained postures. Um, again, I said this is more of like a working diagnosis, but not necessarily for every dystonia that you want to describe. But still, it holds true for most of them. So if the sustained postures are present, you want to see if there is a clinical evidence of muscle contraction. Um, so uh, if you see a, a focal or a writer's cramp, you will not only see the uh, muscle contractions, uh, but you can also uh, do the EMGs, and also that will show you uh, uh, a lot of firing. Um, if it does not show you, then you want to think of diagnosis some other than dystonia. It's called pseudodystonia, and we'll go over some list of those uh, uh, cases. If it's yes, then again, it points towards dystonia. Um, is, again, in sustained posture, is there a clinical suspicion of origin in spinal cord or periphery? Some injury or, um, or it happened after um, some trauma, uh, then, and if it's yes, then again, you want to think of pseudodystonia. But if you don't think there is any evidence of spinal cord involvement or uh, origin from peripheral, uh, then you want to think back to dystonia again. And these are some ancillary features, but they, these are really important. They can really guide you uh, towards the diagnosis. So a null point meaning uh, there is, in their movements, uh, there is some point where they feel that the movements are worse, and there is a point where they feel the movements are better. Um, state function meaning, again, in a particular, um, uh, so some of the movements can be better in performing some task, but they can be worse in performing other tasks. Um, Mirror dystonia meaning uh, they're trying to do certain movement um, and there can, can be a, a dystonia of the hand, but at the same time they can predict a dystonia on the other side or other limb as well. Um, and then co-contractions, uh, meaning uh, there are always uh, contractions of the flexors and extensors at the same time. Uh, task specificity is one thing, and also the sensory gesture. This is a very interesting phenomenon, and so far it's only associated with dystonia that we see. Uh, we have not seen it in any other condition so far. So this is a video actually by Dr. Frucht, uh, <coughs> and he basically describes all these ancillary features and helps us uh, <coughs> diagnose these dystonia in a more clinical uh, way. So again, we talk about the, um, uh, the speed of this movement. Again, not too small, not too big not too fast. You can see that the right arm has some issues. And again, here is the left one. And they are not too regular. We talk about the postures. So this is a small kid with uh, uh, dystonia, but you can see that there is obviously abnormal posture um, because of the cocon. And again, sometimes it can be sustained. This is more of a generalized dystonia. And you can see that there are contractions and some relaxation, but there is obviously a posture. This is more of task-specific dystonia. Yeah. And you can see that uh, one of the muscle goes into the contraction, and these are some of the ancillary features. And these really help you. So sensory trick is basically he's trying to play the flute. If you put the hand here, he's able to play it well enough. And this is another, uh, it's basically a closed circuit. Um, so this is a patient with a cervical dystonia, and the moment she touches her chin by herself, that gets better. But if somebody else touches it, it doesn't get better. So that's another a very peculiar thing about this, is that it's sort of a closed circuit. We again talked about task specificity. Um, 
it can be anything we we are seeing different uh, instruments being played and um this is basically over the period of time and she she has this very severe form of oromandibular dystonia again getting worse with trying to chew so, or having a chewing movement this is again you can just see this uh while while somebody's trying to go down the stairs but getting up there is literally nothing and this is this is what people uh, this word led uh, to believe for some people that this was psychogenic like how can they have Estonia one way and not the other way and the null point that i talk about it's worse in some some uh, postures and better in some postures so you can certainly see that it gets worse while trying to uh, hyperextend and this is the most common form that we see uh, is rider's cramp you can see is a left-handed man trying to write but obviously gets worse now the, here is the mirror dystonia that i talk about now he's trying to write with the right hand but then you see the dystonia coming back again on the left now this is the uh, posture that we talk about you can see the muscle contraction but when he's trying to walk that gets better So these are some of the features which can basically help you uh, diagnose the dystonia. Um, these are the uh, different uh, things which can look up, uh, show as the uh, dystonias, but they may not be. And you want to obviously very carefully examine these patients. Um, so uh, dystonic tics uh, that we see a lot of times in patients with Tourette's. Um, head tilt, uh, we've had this. It's like patients who have uh, fourth nerve palsy may have a, a, a head tilt to accommodate their vision. uh cantocormia that sometimes is associated with uh, uh parkinsons may look like a dystonia initially um obviously the uh cervical neck issues can all uh, predict uh and they may present with the sustained postures um torticollis uh dupuytren's contracture isaac syndrome uh, also known as neuromyotonia uh where there is more of a muscle stiffness which progressively gets worse um but uh, there is also other autonomic features with that so that's an that's a difficult one to di differentiate but that's still to keep in mind and uh sandifer syndrome this is more we see in uh, pediatric uh, population where they come in uh, with uh, different muscle spasms and um usually they have a uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease esophagitis um there sometimes diagnosis can be misleading in terms of this they can be thought to have uh, seizures or infantile spasms or dystonia so you have to uh make sure that these are not the cases classification uh again for every disease it is, is important you want to classify them for uh, various reasons you want to know what is actually causing the dystonia uh you want to know um what diagnostic testing you want to order and obviously the management especially in cases of dystonia where the etiology is very vast um so back in 1976 when dr fan uh came up with the classification it was pretty simple uh one was primary where they did not know initially the reason there were obviously hereditary uh, uh or uh, genetic causes uh but that time we did not know of those genes and then secondary was uh, either from uh, some trauma infection uh, or they were associated with some of the other uh, degenerative uh, neurological diseases and then the third was psychological later on they thought that they would also want to uh, bring out in terms of classification was focal meaning a part of the body is affected uh it can be uh, a distal limb or proximal limb segmental and then generalized um slowly we started learning more about these and the classification continued to get a little bit more uh, complicated and uh, in 2011 uh, once we knew that there were a lot of genes uh we wanted to keep it a little bit simple uh but still uh it was defined in a different way uh, so uh, one was based on the age at the onset So uh in one of the studies of DYT1 uh in in New York uh they saw that the DYT1 was very less common uh if it was later than 26 years. So 
based on just DYT1 studies, they said, okay, you know, if this patient is 26 years or older, it's less likely to be genetic. Um, and then if it's younger than 26, you want to consider them for DYT1. Um, and then based on that, later on, they also came up with the distribution and then etiologies, where uh, primary was more so uh, in terms of uh, more of genetic causes or causes we did not know about. Um, and then secondary causes, Estonia plus meaning they had some other movement disorder along with that. Again, as I said, you do not consider tremor as a dystonia plus. But if you had uh, Parkinson's, if you had myoclonus, those type of features, then you had a different diagnosis to consider. Um, and then um, if you had another neurological disease going on with that, then the diagnosis was, again, given in a different classification. So uh, again, they revised the classification in 2013. Uh, Again, this gets a little bit more complicated, uh, but they came up with the idea that we want to just define on the two different axes. One is the clinical feature, the other is the etiology. Uh, so based on clinical features, they said uh, age of onset, they realized that the 26 age uh, cutoff was not necessarily holding true for everybody. So then they defined age in terms of zero to two years, where they thought this would be more of like uh, patients who have uh, cerebral palsy or any antenatal insult and causing uh, issues. Uh, childhood, maybe some uh, metabolic uh, derangements uh, and other degenerative disease. Adolescent was, again, that was more uh, consistent with primary dystonias and uh, familial history about those early adulthood and late adulthood. Uh, so most of the fake uh, focal dystonias you start seeing at around this age, like cervical dystonia, rhinitis cramp, um, that usually you see around this, this age group. Um, and then body distribution, I already spoke about uh, focal, segmental, multifocal, meaning involving a lot of different areas of the body. It can be generalized. Uh, and then a hemidystonia, meaning involving half of the body. Uh, temporal patterns, disease course. Uh, in that, basically, it was one time insult, and then the disease remained the same. That typically happens a lot of times in patients with focal dystonia, is that they will have a, a limb onset dystonia, and that that's how they will remain for the rest of their life. Or it can be progressive, where um, it begins from hand and then it can progress on to become generalized. Um, isolated dystonia and then dystonia plus, we already talked about that, and then other uh, neurological uh, diseases. And uh, diagnosis based on etiology, uh, again, if you have uh, on exam some evidence of degeneration or an evidence of structural lesion, uh, then you can uh, define it uh, in a better way in terms of etiology and trying to figure out. And that's how your management will also differ. But if you don't have any structural uh, defect, then um, that, then you want to think about some genetic causes. Um, inherited, uh, that's where most of the DYTs are, and I'll go over some of them real quick. Um, and then other acquired causes, whereas where it can be from perinatal injury, uh, neoplastic infection, vascular, brain injury, drugs, uh, psychogenic was included here, and then toxic. Uh, idiopathic, again, these are different from uh, the different DYTs. Now that we know all these different genes, these are uh, some sporadic cases where there is no family history, or there are familial cases, but we do the genetic study and we don't know uh, what defect is there. So, uh, so far, uh, since the diagnosis of DYT1 back in 1985, we, uh, with the genetic studies uh, and PCR amplifications, we found out about uh, 25 different uh, loci, uh, and every loci was named as it was actually uh, diagnosed. But then we soon realized that some of them were sort of similar, um, and slowly we have also found out some um, other genes, actually, uh, which is causing that. Uh, the DYT1, uh, uh, I mean, these are, again, a big list. Uh, we don't necessarily have to know all of them um, in hand, but this is just to kind of give you an idea as to uh, what different uh, etiology can be possible in, in, dif in different population. <coughs> and uh, in, in that, actually, they came up also with uh, uh, dyskinesias. Um, they were finding this loci and they found these as well, which were caused more of dyskinesias and not necessarily dys dystonias. But these were pretty in interesting in terms of that they were rocks as well. Uh, either they could be associated with movement or without movement, um, and they could be episodic as well. Um, so that's how they classified these uh, genetic uh, types of dystonias. So we'll go over uh, some of the mo um, 
more relevant ones and or maybe more common ones. Um, DYT1, uh, that's, a, that's also called as Oppenheim dystonia because that's very close to what Oppenheim had described in terms of descript description. Uh, it's also called as uh, TOR1 because that's the actually mutation uh, on the gene. Um, it's largely found in the Jewish population. That's where it was described earlier, but we have also found this in, in uh, non-Jewish population. Uh, initially, the thought was that Jewish would have uh, autosomal dominant and then non-Jewish population would have autosomal recessive. But with studies, we've shown that both of them can have autosomal dominant, uh, DYD1. Um, it's typically because of deletion of gag triplets in long arm of chromosome 9. Um, although it is autosomal dominant, just like others, uh, it has a very low penetrance. Uh, it can vary from only 30 to 40 percent. So not everybody who has mutation will have uh, the phenotypic presentation of these patients. Uh, and then even if they have phenotypic uh, presentation expression, there is a large variety in terms of the expression. Some of them, uh, so if you take a, one family, uh, some of them will have severe form where uh, they will have generalized dystonia. They may have dystonic storms, which is a very severe form of dystonia. But some of them may not have it, or even if they have it, they may have just focal dystonia. So even within the same family, they may have a, uh, phenotypic variation in terms of expression. Mean of age of onset, uh, uh, it's typically uh, 13 years, plus or minus 8. But usually, most of them are less than 26. There is only one case described uh, where uh, in the family, patient had cervical dystonia at the age of 65. But most of them are uh, lower than 26. Um, usually begins in the limbs. Um, Ideally, more in lower extremities than the upper extremities, and then tends to generalize. Um, but only very few spread to face, jaw, or tongue. So not necessarily all of them will have a cranial uh, distribution. Um, and the, how is the risk related? So if they begin early, and if they begin from leg, then they are more prone to have a, a cranial involvement and more generalized involvement. Uh, so if they appear later on, then there is a less chances of them actually generalizing. Um, and the guidelines are that you know if you uh, if you find that these patients uh, are before 26, then you do want to consider them for genetic counseling. It is important because, as I said, that um, it it really depends how you will manage these patients uh, once you have the diagnosis. DYT6, um, it's a little bit similar to DYT1, uh, but it's a different mutation. It's a TAP1 mutation. Um, and it's largely, although found in uh, Amish Mennonite uh, population, um, here the penetrance level is higher. Um, starts <clears throat> around at the same age, but it can go up to 38 years old, uh, of age. Uh, here the arm onset is more common, and it, this one does affect uh, more of face and neck than the other one. Um, so this severely causes uh, dys dysphonias and other oromandibular dystonia. So there is a uh, involvement of a face in a severe way. Um, he, the other one uh, was a deletion mutation, but here there are a lot of uh, mutations which can actually cause this abnormality. Um, it typically won't cause the adult uh, focal onset of dystonias, and because it can cause a lot of different mutations, we don't know uh, whether to tell patients to undergo genetic counseling. But again. The regular principle should be that if they are young enough, then you do want to consider them, consider them for genetic counseling with the family history. Uh, this is a very peculiar uh, form of dystonia uh, called DOPA responsive dystonia. Uh, most of the cases are autosomal dominant, but there are some autosomal recessive cases. Uh, this is basically because of the mutation in uh, GTP cyclohydrolase gene, which is very important for the formation of tetrahydrobiopterin which is the uh, uh, cofactor used uh, by the enzyme thyroxine hydroxylase, which basically helps uh, convert uh, the phenylalanine to dopamine. So very important in, in st step of uh, uh, dopamine formation. So if there is a, a mutation in this gene, it leads to autosomal dominant pattern of the uh, dystonia. And if there is a mutation in thyroxine hydroxylase gene, uh, then it leads to more of autosomal recessive form. Um, Again, the onset is usually in the first decade of life. Uh, it, it typically affects the foot and then uh, uh, generalizes. This dystonia has typically the diurnal variation, uh, meaning that as the day advances, uh, their dystonia tends to get worse. Um, 
but they respond excellently to uh, uh, low dose levodopa and even anticholinergics. Uh, they may have uh, Parkinsonian features. They may have even uh, different forms of dystonia. They may have oromandibular uh, dystonias. They may have uh, cognitive issues. They may have psychiatric issues as well. So uh, the, because there is this is a spectrum, uh, somebody who ever responds to levodopa, you again want to consider uh, uh, genetic studies in these patients. And we'll go over this again. Uh, yes. Why would this mutation in this gene cause dystonia and not Parkinson's disease? As I said, again, there is a lot of uh, phenotypic variation, so uh, we don't necessarily know why does it cause one than the other. We know that these are the genes causing this, but we don't know why. It's, and even the, about the penetrance, we don't know why it doesn't happen. Is the same mutation? I mean, you can have mutations in the same gene that yes. produce different kinds of gain or loss of function. Yes. In this case, does exactly the same mutation produce different phenotypes? Uh, actually, yes. Uh, exactly the same mutation. So there are three different, actually there are three different genes affected, and I'll go through that, and all of them will have a little bit of a different presentation, but still you may see a combination of all. So there are three main genes, and I'll actually go through them later on, but there is a little bit of a variation, but they still may have combination of the features. But the typical uh, one, which we always know about, uh, is usually causes dystonia and some Parkinsonian features, but not necessarily the other issues. But the other genetic abnormality called SDP uh, may have other features of mental retardation and cognitive uh, uh, side effects. The myoclonus dystonia, um, again, that's uh, another autosomal dominant with uh, maternal imprinting. Um, Usually the onset is uh, in the first or second decade of life. Um, and again, it tends to affect the up, upper extremities. Um, and these are peculiar with uh, uh, some myoclonic jerks. Um, so, um, and another important thing in these is that they respond very well to um, alcohol. Uh, and the myoclonus and the dystonia tends to get better with that. Um, in these patients, uh, there is a high incidence of uh, psychiatric issues, mainly the OCD. Uh, and the gene we have found is uh, the epsilon cyclopalycan gene. Uh, so that's that. So what do you think this one is? That's Dr. Lafayette. So she's asking how often these spasms happen, and he's trying to say it two, twice. Twice a day. Oh, 20 to 30 times a day. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
and there's a variability to it as well. They are not always the same what he kind of tries to do. And um, the finger to nose that we saw was clearly looking psychogenic as to he always tried to make sure that he would not touch the finger but always go on the side and always not touch the nose but go on the side. Um, this is a very difficult diagnosis but you know you need uh, to spend some time with them before you call them off saying functional dystonia. So these are some of the features abrupt onset, inconsistent movements, incongruous movements and postures um, and they have abnormal posturing. The one patient we saw was kind of arching forward and then having some myoclonic jerk that way and they have a lot of different movements which sometimes it's very hard to define. Um, but they can be distracted. They are usually paroxysmal, uh, although there is a lot of literature written on sustained postures. Um, and there is still uh, under um, scrutiny is that really a dystonia or not. Um, and then um, also so a lot of the, these patients will have side-to-side uh, -side movements, again, which is less likely to be uh, organic. <laughs> So that was the functional part. Uh, this is a long and impressive list of uh, um, heterodegenerative uh, disease uh, or dystonia. Uh, typically, again, we will see most of them in the pediatric age group, uh, and uh, our pediatric neurologists are well aware of most of these diseases. Uh, but uh, the most common ones to not miss are Wilson's disease uh, and uh, uh, neurodegenerative uh, uh, disease with the brain ion accumulation. Um, there is more written on that now, and there are some uh, medical trials going on with that as well. Another peculiar uh, mineral, which is actually, uh, I forgot to put it here, is the manganese. Um, there is a lot written now with the manganese toxicity uh, causing uh, more Parkinsonian features, but there is a lot written now for even manganese uh, deficiency causing dystonia. So you do want to check levels and then um, uh, see if you can revert that because it is actually one of the things which can uh, reverse some of these features. Other diseases are lysosomal storage diseases, uh, inborn error of metabolism, amino acid acidurias, uh, mitochondrial disorders, uh, and some of the trinucleotide repeat expansion, and some of the degenerative uh, processes. On the adult side, um, the most common one is uh, hemidystonia that you see with uh, uh, CBD, uh, corticobasal degeneration, um, but then there are other uh, conditions as well. Um, so again, this is just a snapshot, um, and this is some of the suggestion as how you can work them up in terms of what additional features you, you would have that will help you point towards one particular disease. Um, so in, ca in cases of uh, kids, so if there is abnormal birth history or uh, perinatal history, if there is a dysmorphism uh, or they are not meeting their milestones, they have other neurological uh, disorders such as seizures, um, hemidystonia. Um, so these are the things which can point you towards other conditions and other causes rather than just the genetic causes of BYTs and such. And these are the, some investigations you can consider in those patients. So if you're thinking it's neuroacanthocytosis, you obviously just a simple test of peripheral blood smear which will show acanthocytes and you can make that diagnosis. Again, it's not that easy but it's still somewhat helpful. Uh, with the uh, 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 Alpha fetoprotein, you can do the etic cetal and uh, Wilson's disease, we all know about the copper and uh, cellulaplasmin. Uh, serum manganese, um, as I mentioned. Uh, and this one is with the uh, deposition of the manganese. Uh, but as I said, the deficiency also should be looked for. Uh, urine amino acids, uh, copper, neuroimaging. Um, so in most of the primary dystonias, neuroimaging may not be as helpful, but most of the secondary dystonias and neurodegenerative dystonias, this is, imaging is really helpful. Not only that, you know, if you see a structural lesion, you can explain a lot of things, but if you don't see a particular lesion, you can pretty much rule out a lot of conditions. Like if you don't have gray matter involvement, you can say that less likely to have mitochondrial disease or other problems. If you have white matter issues, then you can come up uh, with other uh, uh, diagnosis of, uh, from uh, on this. So that's a really helpful study. Uh, DAD scan, um, which is one of the newer uh, neuroimaging techniques uh, for diagnosis of Parkinsonism. <coughs> a lot of times patients will have, patients with Parkinsonism will just present with dystonia, a limb dystonia early in the morning, which gets better. Uh, so that can help you with that as well. Uh, and you do want to try a levodopa trial, because from there you can have uh, certain uh, things.
um, and the liver biopsy and muscle biopsy for uh, other different disorders. Um, so we have just started to know these genes. So this is just, again, a basic guideline. Uh, once you think these are genetic dystonias, how you can go about them. Um, so if you just had a dystonia only, uh, plus or minus tremor, then the first thing you want to think, especially in a young patient, the first thing you want to think is a DOIT1 or TOR1. Um, so if you had a craniocervical uh, involvement, then the first thing you, uh, and this is a genetic test available. You can do this. Uh, it's relatively cheaper, um, so that can be done. If it's negative, then you think of the D by D6 or SAP1 mutation. Um, if these uh, things are not involved. If there is a craniocervical uh, uh, onset uh, or the upper limb onset, and uh, if it has generalized over time, um, then there is this peculiar gait uh, that you see. is called hobby horse gait. It's uh, very interesting. It's a... Uh, one of the dyt 4s which was found in Australian uh, population, where they had laryngeal dysphonias, and they had this gait where it would, they would walk like this, um, and they were found to have these uh, mutations. Um, so if you have a dystonia which begins uh, craniocervical, generalizes over time, and has this type of gait, then you want to think up for dyt 4 and then you can come up with tube 4 uh, uh, a mutation. If not, then again go back to maybe dyt 6 if it does not generalize over time and just remains there, uh, but then there is a head tremor, then you want to think of uh, ANO3, uh, which is DYT12, um, and then uh, other things which are more um, uh, DYT24 and 25. Um, if you have dystonias which are paroxysmal, we already talked about them. Um, if they are induced by movement, meaning paroxysmal kinesiogenic dys dyskinesias, uh, then you want to think of uh, one gene mutation, PRRT2. If they are not induced by movement, then you want to consider MRI, because why do they have paroxysmal movements? Uh, that can help you differentiate as well. Um, and then this is the big spectrum again, uh, if they are responsive to dopamine or not. Um, if they are, um, then you want to consider these three genes. So this is what I was talking about, is GCH1, uh, tyrosine hydroxylase, and uh, SPR. Uh, they have a various uh, presentation. So any patient whom you try dopamine and it worked, you want to consider these three uh, uh, genetic testing for them. If they did not respond, then you look for some other associated signs. So somebody had dystonia, you tried dopamine, it did not work. Um, and um, if they have other signs, so if they have Parkinsonism, mainly rapid onset, then it's uh, uh, ATP A13, again, DYT12 with uh, rapid onset Parkinson's. Um, if it's not rapid onset, then you want to think of uh, other, like the uh, DYD24, 25. Uh, if it has myoclonus, we already talked about that, 11. Uh, and if other complex uh, movement disorders and other uh, non-movement disorder features, then you want to think of the big list of hereditary degenerative. Again, this can be uh, confusing, but this is just the beginning that we are finding out the genetic genes. So this is just some help uh, if you want to try to figure out genetic workout. So I'll jump to treatment. Uh, so we have defined the dystonia. Uh, we have learned different classification. Um, what the treatment remains, uh, and there are four uh, main features we can help with. Definitely the medications. Uh, rehab is very essential. Um, and then chemo denervation and uh, surgery. And we'll try to touch base with every each and every arm. Uh, but you have to stick to general principles. You first, obviously, try to identify the cause. As I mentioned, there are a lot of these etiologies. So first, you try to find out if you have anything which is treatable, Wilson disease or a structural lesion or different metabolic disorders. So you want to try to find them out. Um, if not, then you, if you don't find them, then you want to talk to the family. If there is family history, you want to consider genetic counseling. Um, you want to establish uh, the goals that you know this is what you have and. We may not be able to achieve optimal control, but uh, so uh, that has to be met. You always have to address the comorbidities, uh, uh, depression, uh, and orthopedic complication, because a lot of these patients with chronic dystonias will eventually have uh, uh, contractures and uh, also vertebral column issues. So you want to uh, try to take care of that as well. Um, and uh, you want to encourage patients to find this, uh, find a sensory trick. Uh, typically, it's, uh, it's there are a lot of things. Uh, we talked about the task specificity. We talked about cervical dystonias. And a lot of times, they will find a sensory trick. 
and a lot of times that is just enough like if a, i have a patient uh, and actually we'll show that uh, cervical dystonia and initially it was just helped by wearing a c collar and he didn't have to do anything else um, if that relieves dystonia sure why not try that um, you do want to consider range of motion exercises um, and as i mentioned if it's a young onset you want to try uh, dopamine and you want to reserve the surgical therapy mainly for uh, disabling dystonias which are resistant to pharmacotherapy and uh, maybe botox so physical therapy or supportive measures uh, in the old times they had tried a lot of different uh, uh, apparatus uh, to help mainly the right wrist cramp um, they had tried uh, 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 either uh, with the fingers or with the thumb uh, and this was made by charco uh, where they could see if this could help this was more of what we now call as restraint therapy um so um you want to do this because obviously with the prolonged condition you do want to maintain the range of motion and you do not want to develop contractures so this can help really in that way um immobilization and retraining uh, so again the concept is because uh, the theory is that uh, there is abnormal uh, neuronal sensory uh, perception so if you restrain it uh, and then retrain your brain again with the neuronal uh, neuroplasticity you can actually improve some of the dystonias and again these are very small studies with small set of patients who responded so i'm just giving some examples of that the constraint induced uh, therapy we are already using them in stroke patients brain injury patients uh, where we constrain the other or functional arm and then you just want them to use the other arm and then help the uh, a plasticity come up with uh, improving that um in some patients uh, reading braille for 30 to 60 minutes improve the visual acuity and dystonia uh, again the they went by the same perception of impaired sensory perception of the cortex uh, so doing that was really helpful for some of the patients the mirror imagery uh, and mental practice again what we do sometimes with a lot of these stroke patients as well um uh, uh the transcranial magnetic stimulation uh, this is one thing which has helped in uh, uh, some patients and it is still under investigation there are few people who are interested in this the theory is that uh, because there is a sort of a disinhibition from the cortex um, by tms you temporarily um, inhibit that and then help, uh, hope that typically look for that improvement uh, again these are all temporary and uh, the um, tens unit uh, also has shown some improvement with focal dystonia uh, so this but this was the only double blind placebo control trial which again was a short time there was a, some improvement in, in in the focal dystonia medical therapy um, so all kids with dystonia uh, should receive a trial of levodopa carbidopa um, the anti dopaminergic therapy um, that's a little bit of a complex and a, a, a phenomenon uh, for the most part we know that it may worsen but typically the tardive dystonias respond very well to tetrabenazine um so you can try that especially if there is a history of uh, previous uh, uh, neuroleptic uh, use and then you can try these and see if that improve um anticholinergic remains still the mainstay uh, the trihexafenadyl one of the old anticholinergic uh, this was the first trial back in 1995 uh, where they saw use um uh, used trihexafenadyl on 31 patients and had uh, 71% of them had meaningful improvement at 6 uh, months then 3 years they still out of them 62% still kept on that and they had improvement what is important in these patients is that you start with a very low dose go slow there is actually no limit uh, i mean at least you can use up to 80 mg per day but you have to titrate them up to the side effects so common side effects with these are you know especially in uh, old elderly population you know uh, increasing confusion uh, more dreaded thing you want to make sure that you do not develop glaucoma uh, i have a patient uh, who was complaining of blurred vision uh, and some eye pain and he basically had some increased uh, intraocular pressure um, so you those are the times when you want to cut down on these um, but dr fan um, has used up to 80 and even actually up to 120 mg but in younger patients you can and that's where you can use them is that you have young onset dystonia you can try these where they can tolerate them a little bit better the other side effects you can maintain so with anticholinergics you have issues with constipation you can try mestinon uh, which can help with some of that uh, they have issues with dry eyes and um, uh, the uh, salivation issues where you can use artificial saliva 
especially if it's helping most of the symptoms. So, so that remains the uh, treatment goal. Uh, another one to try is the baclofen, uh, which is the GABA A, um, the GABA B A agonist. It's usually typically useful for generalized and segmental dystonia. There is a trial which was also uh, showing some improvement with the intrathecal baclofen. Um, and it was especially useful in kids who had extrapyramidal uh, CP. And then benzodiazepines have also shown some clonazepam, uh, so some benefit. So these are ABCs, you can call them, uh, for the treatment. Uh, a is artane, that's the trihexyphenidyl, baclofen, and clonazepam. Here, you start with one drug, you see how the response is, you can add another one, and again, you see the response. Um, polypharmacy is a rule rather than ex ex uh, exception. Again, this is coming from people who have used this for a long time, uh, so this is more of like a guideline. Uh, but you can definitely try co combination and you will see some response. Uh, other drugs that you can definitely try are dopamine, tetrabenazine. Amantadine has shown some benefit in some of the patients. Um, so these are various medications that you can try. Um, so the, this was all used before the advent of uh, botulinum toxin, especially uh, in patients with cervical dystonias or focal or segmental dystonias. But then came the botulinum. Um, we've known about this for a long time, uh, but it took a long time for us to start using it. Uh, Dr. Kerner, um, he conducted some uh, uh, tr um, uh, uh, trials on animals and actually also on himself, somewhat in a fatal way, but he did describe that uh, uh, this uh, barricade, this toxin was actually helpful in a way that it was preventing the transmission across the uh, peripheral and autonomic nerves without affecting the sensory uh, uh, input. Uh, he also described uh, 155 cases of sausage poison, um, and again, that's what he showed. And um, he, at that time, had stated that this could be a possible remedy in movement disorder, especially he said uh, sitnam chloria. He even described, because it was affecting the autonomic nerves, you could probably use them in conditions with autonomic issues, especially siluria or hyperhidrosis and things like that. Uh, since then, it took about 150 years for us to try to isolate that toxin, uh, learn about the mechanism, and safely use it uh, over a period of time. And so these are uh, some milestones uh, in terms of botulinum toxin being used in, uh, in, in public. Um, first ever, it was used for strabismus, and it showed benefit. Um, in 1986, uh, it was used for cervical dystonia. It is very interesting. Um, here we have somebody who tried on himself, animals, no IRB, no issues. Here, uh, even to use for blepharospasm, they had to keep a crash cart ready, uh, ER services and things like that was ready, but they, they used it. Uh, and there was a benefit uh, in cranial cervical dystonias and also uh, other cranial cervical dystonias. And finally, in 1989, uh, FDA approved uh, the use for blepharospasm and uh, uh, seventh nerve disorders. Subsequently, we found that it was also helpful for uh, cervical dystonias. Um, obviously, the frown lines, that's where it began, the cosmetic use of that. Um, and then it was also approved for underarm sweating. Um, Slowly, then we started having other uh, types of uh, uh, botulinum toxins, uh, and they were subsequently approved for uh, most of these. So what is the mechanism? Um, it typically binds with the presynaptic acetylcholine nerve terminal and prevents the release of that. It's, it's a three-step process where it uh, goes into the vesicle and prevents the cleavage, um, and um, that's how it prevents the release of acetylcholine and causes neuromuscular blockage. And this is an irreversible blockage, so most of the uh, receptors at the neuromuscular junction basically degenerate. However, they do regenerate uh, um, with the sprouting and maybe in three months. Uh, and that's why you have to repeat this every three to four months for the best efficacy. Um, and these are the different types of botulinum toxin, and that's how they work on different uh, receptors. But most of them work on uh, the SNAP and uh, vesicle-associated membrane proteins. Currently, these are the four uh, uh, preparations available uh, in, uh, in US. Uh, Botox, uh, most of us are familiar with that. That's onobotulinum toxin. Um, it's a vacuum dried. Uh, you can refrigerate that. Uh, another, another one is Dysport, uh, Zeomine, and Myoblog. These three are type A, and this one is uh, type B. Uh, type B.
so currently it's approved for blepharospasm, uh, craniocervical dystonias, laryngeal dystonias, limb. Uh, this is a very difficult technique. You mostly end up doing it under sedation uh, and also using, uh, usually ENT does it, uh, but sometimes you can also you know, inv get involved. Uh, limb dystonias and truncal dystonias as well. Uh, this is one of the patients of Dr. Jankovic he described in uh, Lancet. Uh, this is the effect after four weeks. Uh, typically, the effects start showing in seven days, uh, and then it remains for about three months, and you have to repeat them. And uh, multiple trials have been done. This is one of the patients Can you describe us how with the cervical the dystonia. Neck feels um, like? He's a 60-year-old. He was complaining of this neck pain for a long time. He had seen three different neurologists, and everybody thought this was more of a um, uh, Has spine there issue. You do to make it better? Uh, he underwent two uh, spine surgeries uh, before finally you, di um, being diagnosed as dystonia. He was saying basically he felt that his neck was being drawn. Um, so you can see obviously there is a, a, a posturing with the left lateral colus. He tries. So he tries the cervical collar or the sensory trick and gets some benefit from that. So you can see the muscle contractions there pretty well. And then so again, um, I really did not want to go through the epidemiology of this because you know there are big numbers and there are various numbers. It can be from 200 to 20 to 200 per million, but because it is not still well reported, it's st still very much underdiagnosed. Uh, but it's still common. Um, cervical dystonia typically is a, 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 a disease which can cause lifelong uh, lifelong instability. One of the uh, few conditions of neurological origin which is associated with a lot of pain. 70% of these patients have pain and that r remains uh, more of an issue. It may develop contractures um, and it, uh, if, if it persists then yes it may have radiculopathy and myelopathy down the line if not treated for a long time. Um, first study was again done back in 85 which showed significant improvement. Since then there are about 80 studies done, uh, eight prospective uh, double-blind studies, which has shown significant benefit with this, and that's why this is one of the class one evidence that botulinum toxin does help uh, the patients with cervical dystonias. Um, so typically in these patients, um, medication therapy is not as useful, so you want to try these. However, it's very important that you choose the right muscles because a lot of these patients have a failure to therapy because of the wrong muscles being injected for chemodynamic Surgical treatment, uh, again, I'll go through it real quick. Uh, initially, it was thought that they would uh, resect the cervical roots and see for some improvement. However, there were always questionable benefits on that. Um, then we um, talked about lesional surgeries, uh, the way they were attempted in the mid-20th century. The thalamotomies did show a significant improvement. Um, then came the DBS. Um, the first ever was uh, reported by uh, Dr. Uh, Mundiner and his group, and they said that the, uh, with the slow, low amplitude frequency, uh, there was some benefit uh, in patients with dystonia. Dr. Cooper uh, in, in uh, New York uh, basically uh, showed some benefit with the thalamic stimulation. Um, slowly, so initially we were all doing thalamic stimulations, pallidotomies. They were all good, but there were a lot of side effects with them, especially dysarthria, blurred vision, and such. Uh, but they were getting benefits, so we continued that. However, once we started doing DBS on patients with uh, Parkinson's disease and who had dystonia as well, we saw that there was significant benefit there as well. That's when the uh, target was switched to GPI, which showed uh, significant benefit. Since then, there were mainly two double-blinded trials, which has shown, uh, again, improvement. Um, the numbers here look very high, but one thing to remember is that, you know, these are small patients, you know, the number usually is 40 patients, 50 patients. Uh, so, but still it has shown significant benefit. Um, but the thing you want to remember is that it takes few months uh, to actually start thinking about the surgery and then actually get it. And you always have to think uh, which patients will get benefit. So that's why it's very important. Uh, these are some general guidelines who have benefited. One of the meta-analyses showed that uh, if you had a low preoperative severity score, um, those patients really benefited. Patients with DYT1, really had benefits uh, with this. Uh, if they had younger onset, and if they had lack of uh, fixed skeletal abnormalities. These all patients really benefited well from that. Um, 
but we don't know yet if these the, the patients with secondary dystonias and hereditary degenerative diseases have not gotten so much of benefit there are some case reports here and there of getting some benefits but not necessarily it's an evolving technology uh, how, uh, how long do they follow those patients, and is there a change over time? Yes, so so this this study, uh, one of them was actually, uh, so far we have data till um, eight to nine years. Um, this study was for five years, but there are other studies which have shown data till eight to nine years, and they are effective. There is a little bit of reduction in the score, but not significant. So with ongoing uh, changing the stimulation and trying other things, it has re continued to remain uh, beneficial. So, so far we have data for eight to ten years. Since the first use. This, these are some videos. Uh, this is one of the patients at uh, Mount Sinai, a um, uh, 13 year old kid with a generalized dystonia. Uh, you can see there is a severe involvement uh, with the truncal uh, involvement as well. And he's trying to sit up. And it's, it's worse uh, on the right side than the left side. There is significant disability with that. And this is not psychogenic, we all can say now by defining that. And this is the attempt to write. And this is the abnormal posturing when he tries to get up. Very impressive. Uh, Contract, contractors, not not yet. Contractors not yet formed, but significant postural issues. This is him after um, six months of uh, surgery. Sorry about that. You can see the significant improvement in the posture. Um, he was DYT1 positive. Much better in terms of fine movements as well. Although uh, still the gait was an issue in this video. And I'll jump onto the next video as we are running out of time. Uh, and that was at three years, basically. And he looked like a different person. OK, nice and loud. Important thing to remember is uh, it again also takes a while to show the effect of the uh, DBS as well. So you do need uh, different setting changes, have to go to and go through intensive rehab, may try some medications as well. So this is not like next day you wake up after DBS and you're like that. No, it takes a few months. Uh, so those things, so that's why expectations are supposed to be discussed. You can see the posturing is so much better. Um, he can actually, he's shown to run actually in this video and looks pretty impressive. So yes, it is an evolving technology. We are learning more about it and we feel that this is one thing which can definitely benefit some of these patients. But for that, you have to know what is causing that and it's important. Future directions, uh, we know a lot about this in the last 25 years, but still uh, we know there are genes causing mutations, but we don't know why it's affecting others and not uh, everybody. Uh, so we'll be learning uh, more about this hopefully in future. Um, right now there are no new medications being tried. Uh, there are a couple of things which are looking at some receptor uh, change. Uh, ampicillin is also looked at uh, uh, in some patients. Um, Botox, really, we are looking at uh, trying to see if we can find a better combination. Um, there is one trial which is done like a local application uh, just on the eyelid and has shown some benefit without causing much of an issue. Um, surgical treatments, as I said, are, are evolving, which we may lo look at more uh, targets which are more helpful in this. Uh, these were all experimental, um, but hopefully in next 20, in last 25 years, we have seen a lot of improvement. So next 25, hopefully, we'll be looking at something better than that.
Um, I really want to thank Dr. Lafayette. Unfortunately, she could not make it because of the vacation. Dr. Olson, Dr. Remel for always being there, and uh, Dr. Evans uh, for all the encouragement. Thank you all for my colleagues. And that's all I have. These are the references. Thank you. So I have a question regarding the pathophysiology. Uh, yes. It might be important. So did you come across any studies looking at the role of glycine in the pathophysiology of dystonia? Because we know, you know that baclofen works is a carb agonist. And, uh, uh, and we also know that glycine is a co-agonist with carbo. Sure. And the receptors. Sure. I mean, have you come across any studies? So glycine, and like we all know about LUT1, uh, and <coughs> not only just the seizures, but also about the stonians, that is one uh, thing there. When we are talking about pathophysiology, we now are starting to learn from genetic aspect, molecular aspect, neurotransmitter. So there is a role, but not yet in terms of specialty. We know that it is more of a network issue rather than it's just a basal ganglia. We know there is a cortex involvement. We know there is a cerebellum involvement. Uh, but we don't know specifically as yet. Like, what it, because as I said, the etiology is so vast and wide, it's difficult to point one or two.